from our Wednesday night Bible studies, going through the book of John, we hit John chapter 3, and we hit this verse, the third verse. Very truly I tell you, this is Jesus talking to Nicodemus, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And that word kingdom just jumped out of the page at me. Kingdom. Now, as we know it, we have a natural, everything in the natural shows you something about the supernatural, right? The seeds, the, the, the father-son relationship. I mean, the way things re regenerate. Everything in the physical will show you what happens in the spiritual. So a kingdom, as we know it in the physical, there are parallels, but it's a little bit different. This kingdom that Jesus is talking about, it seems to move around. Now, that's not our experience. Like, we wouldn't pick up Chatham, you know, if Chatham is a kingdom, we wouldn't pick up Chatham and send it south of Tilbury, and now there's the kingdom of Chatham. You don't do that. You don't move the kingdom of this and move it to over here. There are, you can conquer areas and it becomes, you know, expansion of the kingdom, but you do not move kingdoms. But this kingdom seems to move around. We have Jesus, when he comes on the scene, he says, the kingdom has come near. The kingdom has come near. Well, that tells me that it's moving. Then he says, in Matthew chapter 12, 28, he's actually getting bothered by the Pharisees who are saying he's, he's casting out demons because of, you know, in the power of Satan. And he's going, no, I'm not. But if it is by, and then he says this, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. You know what I can take from that? Jesus is the kingdom of God. He's not just the king. He is the kingdom. He's, he didn't say that the king has come, has come upon you. He said the kingdom has come upon you. If the spirit is doing something, then you are functioning in the kingdom. Jesus is the king. Wherever he is, that's where the kingdom is. Now start to think about some of the things. In fact, I prayed for the, the beginning of the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That's Jesus come. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. When Jesus said, seek first the kingdom and all these things will be added unto you. What's he saying? He's not saying seek a, seek a location or even seeking a function. He's saying seek me. Because the kingdom has come near, the kingdom has come upon you. You seek me, Jesus says, and you'll be functioning in the kingdom. And everything will be added to you. So there's some kingdom principles. And then we're going to look at some parables and try to find some more kingdom principles within the parables that Jesus spoke about the kingdom. And this morning, I'm just skimming the surface. You want to really dive into the kingdom and all of the... All of the parables that Jesus spoke about the kingdom of God, it's immense. So hopefully, you know what a preacher's, a preacher's job is, is to get a conversation going between you and the Lord. I'm not supposed to give it all to you. I'm supposed to spark a conversation between you and the Lord. And so that's what I want to do this morning and get you really thinking about how do you function in the kingdom? First of all, one of the, the first principle I want to bring out is to acknowledge the king. That's how a king becomes a king, by the way, on earth. If we go back to the Old Testament, we see Rehoboam, the, the son of Solomon. So you had David, David's son, get famous King David, and then his son was Solomon, and then his son was Rehoboam. Well, Rehoboam wasn't a very wise man. And he decided not to listen to the old elders. He decided to listen to his friend. And so he essentially tells Israel, it's the dynasty of David. He's rightfully the king. 
But he tells them, you think my dad, he tells the people in Israel, you think my dad was hard on you, Solomon? I'm going to be even more hard on you. Well, guess what? They rejected him as king. And another man, Jeroboam, he rises up and they receive him as king. There goes the dynasty. Now in God's faithfulness, telling David that there would always be a king from his line, he separates Israel in this north and south. North Israel is Israel, and south Israel becomes Judah. And the line of David, his, his line are, is the dynasty in Judah. But here you've got, you got a whole nation that rejected Rehoboam as a king. We don't care who your daddy was, you're not our king. So, come into the spiritual kingdom and acknowledging Jesus as king, acknowledging him as king. Now, first of all, he's king whether you think he is or not. That's the difference. His, he's the king of his kingdom, whether, whether 8 billion people think he is or not. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That's the big difference between the, the physical principles and the spiritual principles. But when you acknowledge, here's the parallel between the earthly king and the heavenly king. When you acknowledge Jesus as the king, you come into the kingdom. That was what he quote, that's what he said. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. What's born again? It's when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Now you come into the kingdom. When you receive him as, as Lord and Savior, you now come into the kingdom, and that's you recognizing Jesus as the king. See, people were with Jesus and not in the kingdom. They were with the king, but not in the kingdom. That, that's fascinating to me. There were crowds and crowds of people, the ones who believed, they're in the kingdom. The ones who didn't believe, they'd be standing right beside him, right beside the king and not be in the kingdom. And I feel like that's a warning shot for the churches today. Going to church does not bring you into the kingdom. Singing songs about the king does not bring you into the kingdom. Functioning with Jesus, acknowledging him as king, brings you into the kingdom. And thank God for his blood that, that covers all of our sins. And so I just... Oh, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself. So recognizing the kingdom, is, or the king is the first principle. The second is this kingdom does have a location. You. The ones that recognize Jesus as the king. The kingdom is in you. Jesus is the kingdom. When you became, when you received him as Lord and Savior, received the sacrifice of sin, the kingdom came into you. Now, where's the kingdom? Right here. I can move it over here. The kingdom's out here. The kingdom's out here. The kingdom now has moved over here. Out here is not the kingdom. This actually is Satan's domain out here. And so you are a kingdom within a kingdom. But your kingdom has power over this kingdom. Because the king of this world, the God of this world, as the Bible calls him, the God of this world has blinded the minds of, of unbelievers so that they cannot see the truth. But the king of this kingdom, he's the king of all kings. And so you can walk around with confidence. I don't know why I haven't, haven't thought it. Like I always talk about us being the temple of the Holy Spirit and that's powerful. But there's something that's changing in me as I, as I walk into a room, as I walk down a hallway of a hotel or I walk out in the parking lot or as I walk around the streets of our city of that kingdom knowing now full well that I bring the kingdom of God wherever I go. The Bible calls us ambassadors. An ambassador is someone that goes, that belongs to a kingdom, but goes to another kingdom and represents the kingdom they came from. 
right? You have embassies and ambassadors are in the embassy. So in, in uh, the Ukraine, you'd have a Canadian embassy and a U.S. embassy, and there's and the ambassadors are there. The cool thing about this is that though we're ambassadors, wrap your, your brain around this. Though we're ambassadors in this kingdom, representing another kingdom. We also bring that kingdom, not just the ambassador, but we bring the kingdom into that other kingdom. That's mind-blowing to me. Okay, so let, let's dig a little bit deeper. Another kingdom principle is that we honor and obey the king. You can't make up your own rules in this kingdom. You can't out here. And they call it the tolerant society. You know, Christianity is the arch enemy of every other religion, unfortunately. Because all the other religions, they'll even include Jesus as a good prophet. But Christianity comes on the scene and says, there is only one God. There is only one Savior. He is Jesus, and we are intolerant to anything else. And as I said before, the other religions have good things to say. A lot of them have actually unpacked truths of Scripture and put them into their doctrine. When, when, when you know, Jesus said, you seek the truth, you're going to find it. Not necessarily be saved, but you're going to, you seek truth, you're going to find it. And so things like the yin-yang, right, or karma. Karma comes right back to you. That's in the Bible. It's called you reap what you sow. And so these other religions have good things to say. But we're intolerant because there is only one king and one kingdom. And, there, and one Savior, and His name is Jesus. So you can't make up your own rules in this intolerant kingdom. But why would you? When the King, the God of the universe, who knows how everything functions, creates the rules and regulations within this kingdom, that's where you're safest. Getting a little ahead of myself again. We honor and obey the King, and as we did this morning, we worship the King. Here's the amazing thing, is that that king wants a relationship with you. The king of all kings wants to have a relationship with you. Within, you know, like do we, do we take advantage of this all-powerful, all-knowing being, and he wants he wants to hang out with you. Do we take full advantage of that? I don't think I do. I'm trying to. I'm trying to acknowledge him in all my ways. I'm trying to talk to him 24-7. You know, as I'm having conversations, meanwhile I'm saying, God, what do you think? What do you think? Help me give the words to say and words not to say. You know, just taking advantage of this all-powerful being that lives in us, we're functioning in a kingdom in us. We need to step out like we did this morning. Step out and, and pray and come before the throne boldly for healing, for relationships, for this life, for this, this kingdom out here. Another thing about the kingdom, another kingdom principle, is that you have, it's not going to seem like it, but you have protection and provision as part, as a member of this kingdom. You have protection. Look at the, the, you know, the incident on the 401. That could have been a whole lot worse. But girl, babe, you're here today. And there's protection and there's provision. Some of you need to hear that and you need to find confidence in that. Because God, though it's Satan's kingdom, he owns it. God owns it all. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And I know it can become confusing, but let me just let me just go off and digress for a little bit. When God created the earth, of course he had full authority over it. When he created Adam and Eve, he gave the authority to them. Subdue it, Genesis says. I give you full authority over this earth. Subdue it. But then when they sinned, when they chose that fruit, 
instead of God. They rejected God. Now sin comes into the world and essentially they handed the authority that was given to them over to Satan. That's why Satan has the audacity when Jesus is, is uh, in the wilderness to say, Jesus, all of this is mine, but I'll give it to you if you worship me. What a rat. Like, that is, he's either really, really dumb or he's really, really audacious. But when Jesus died on the cross, and stole the keys of hell, death, and Hades, and rose victorious over it, making a public spectacle of the enemy. When you, so he took the authority, took the authority back for, to give to, remember he said to the disciples, I give you all authority to drive out demons. So though Satan still is, is out in this kingdom. That authority that supersedes his authority is in you. It's in your mouth. I love being a part of this kingdom. All right, now I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. We're going to camp here for just a little while. Matthew chapter 13. There's tons, this is so rich, but I've picked out only a few so that, again, skim the surface and get you curious and get you functioning properly in this kingdom and get you curious to know more about it. Matthew chapter 13, we're going to go to verse 24, we're going to look at the parable of the weeds. And here it is, Jesus starts right at 24, Jesus told him another parable. He says this, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds, tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it to my barns. He later interprets that. We're not going to look at the interpretation, but if you if, if you didn't catch the story, uh, then you can go and read the interpretation. But I, I'll tell you what, what it is all the same. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. What's that? It's Jesus coming and dying on the cross and rising from the dead. And now anyone who receives him, that's the good seed. That's the good seed. And that's him. He's sowing this seed. So, he, so you're the good seed. But this parable tells us that you're living. Though you have the kingdom of God in you. You have the good seed in you. Because this is a parable with the kingdom of heaven. Though you're living in the kingdom, you're also living amongst weeds in another kingdom. And see how the two kingdoms mix. And by God's design, but also by his graciousness, he lets us all live together until the end. And then the harvesters will separate. The harvester will separate the wheat from the weeds. But until then, unfortunately, you're living amongst weeds, folks. And Jesus makes it perfectly clear. But don't let those weeds choke you out. And the, and the gardener, if he thought the weeds were going to choke us out, he, he, would, he would risk it by pulling them out. But, but by his design, because it's by his design, you can have confidence that those weeds around you, those weeds that are blocking your view, they are there on purpose. And so you're safe. To put this into a microcosm, the other thing I want to I just mention, I'll digress here. 
is that when when the weeds so you notice the plants are growing up no one sees the weeds yet it's not until the plant is grown a little bit higher that you see the weeds so by the time it once those weeds get so high that you can't stand it anymore you can be sure that a harvest is coming you can be sure that a harvest is coming because those weeds as soon as they get high enough as soon as the wheat gets high enough the harvest is coming and you'll be free from it all amen, amen. okay let's look at another parable matthew 13 we're going to go to the 31st verse he told them another parable the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field though it is the smallest of all seeds yet when it grows it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches let's just sit there for a minute so the kingdom of heaven is like not just any old seed but a mustard seed which is the smallest of seeds but grows into the biggest of trees <laughs> without Jesus Without that seed, you're just dirt. What's a farm field without seed? Dirt. What's a farm field with seeds? Ready for the harvest. It's, if, if Stan was here, it's money, baby. It's money. And it's good. It's the thing that sustains us. This mustard seed, and I, I think what Jesus is saying here is when you give your life to Jesus, it may or may not in you feel significant or not but the seed is there and over time as you mature in the Lord as you as you dive into the word right and you learn and you have conversations Jay being a young Christian is one of the hungriest Christians in this room hungry for the things of the kingdom well let's talk about it I want to know I don't want to not know I want to know and so as and so that you, I know because I've talked to you, you, you have felt, because you're a young Christian, that you just have a little seed in there. Almost can't see it. Almost can't feel it. But it's growing, man. It's growing. And then I see, I see people that have been Christians for decades. For decades. And what you need to know. I guess I want to ask you, who's perching on you? Who's perching on you? What, what do you have? That mustard seed, has it grown into a tree that the people around you are able to perch on? That your family is able to perch on? That's what's going to happen as the seed grows. Right, Jay? You're already guiding your family to the Lord. And I bet you, you don't stay quiet about Jesus in the workplace. That here comes Jay again. And that's the that's when that's the tree's growing, and you have things perching on you. And so the question that you need to ask yourself is, who's perching on me? Do I have anything that I that people can perch on? Am I an encourager? Am I a giver? Am I a server? Jesus, even the King of Kings said, I didn't come to serve, or to be served, but to serve. To serve to the extent that I'll give my life as a ransom for many. Oh, all of us are perching on that boy, you know. All of us perch on Jesus. And Jesus is in you. What do you have for people to perch on? And it may be how you use your vehicle. It may be how you use your money. It may be how you use your home, how you use your time. Let people perch on you. All right, let's move on. See? Kingdom principles right out of right out of what we know from earthly kingdoms and also from these parables so rich. Verse 33, he told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour 
until it worked all through the dough. Yeast. Remember I said one of the kingdom principles, you can't make up your own rules? Does the dough affect the yeast? The yeast affects the dough. And I think some of you have come to Jesus and you're telling him how things are going to work out. You're telling him what we're going to do today. The yeast affects the dough. And if you start your day with Jesus, what do you want to do today? Let's talk. Let's walk together. I want you to affect every part of me because the yeast goes through just some of the dough. No. The kingdom of, in the kingdom of heaven, the yeast goes all through the dough. And that baker just keeps going until he has, he has worked it out. And in the crushing, in the pressing, he is making new wine. In the crushing, in the pressing. And for every crush that he does, every, the yeast, his yeast, the kingdom of God, is working through you. Consider it pure joy when you go through trials of all kinds. Pure joy. Cheryl, shake her head. What in the world are you talking about? Consider it pure joy when you go through trials of all kinds because it's working out something in you that's more precious than gold, silver, or costly stones. Yuck. <laughs> but then my brain says, no. But my spirit says, bring it on. My grace is sufficient for God said and that that word grace in the original Greek means his influence on your life and the ref, on, your influence on your heart and the reflection in the life. Bring it on. If it means more of you and, and more, more things for people to perch on, bring it on. Ooh, wow. This is good. The yeast. You want, you want the king to teach you about the kingdom. If you're going through a jungle, a wild jungle, and you have a guide, how close to the guide would you be? You'd be like, can you just... <laughs> you hear noises. You hear a roar. You hear a slither. You hear this. You hear that. You see this. You see that. What was that? Can you just want to channel? It's okay. We're going to get through this. Just watch. And how closely would you listen to his instruction and do what he said? We are a kingdom within this kingdom. We want to listen closely and obey. Don't touch that. Don't touch that. That thing. Don't do that. See there? You can walk there. Yep. Don't. And then we could just follow me. You're in the jungle, baby. <laughs> to quote Guns N' Roses. But yeah. <laughs> I've never quoted Hard Rock before my sermon. There you go. All right, a couple more, a couple more. No, one more. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Matthew 13, verse 44. And this is the last parable that we'll look at. You can see I'm skipping a whole bunch of parables. I do want to... You want to dive into the kingdom, right? And I can see the look on your faces. You're excited about this kingdom living and kingdom principles. Uh, verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and he bought it. I surrender all. How precious is the king to you? How precious is the kingdom to you? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I don't need anything else. The Lord, I... And then, that, so that's, that's Psalm 23. Now let's go to Philippians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul says, I consider all things a loss compared to the greatness of knowing Jesus. 
I consider them garbage, rubbish, he says, compared to the greatness of just knowing Jesus. I want to know Jesus. And listen to how these parables come alive now, now, that, now that we've been examining. He says, I want to know you in your death so that somehow I can share in your resurrection. You want resurrection? You want resurrected life? Living things don't resurrect people. Dead things resurrect. You gotta have a death before you have a resurrection. And that's the need. It's a question. That's the yeast that's flowing through. But you keep going, and people will be perching on you because you'll be so strong in the Lord. You'll be functioning in the kingdom. People will be coming to you. But let's look at these. I'm, I'm going back into the others. I just see the tapestry of all these of kingdom principles and all these uh, parables. But let's go back to this one. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. When a man found it, he hid it again. Sold all that he had in his joy. Went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Jesus goes into Jerusalem knowing that he's facing his death. He gets betrayed by Judas, his friend. Judas, do you betray me with a kiss? He then goes to six different court cases back and forth between Roman and Jewish courts. We, who, I, we don't know what to do with this guy. We want him dead. We don't, we, Pilate says, I don't see anything wrong. They're going back and forth, Caiaphas, Pilate, Herod, blah, 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 blah. And he's six court cases. And after most of those court cases, he's getting beaten and flogged. By the time the crowd shouts, crucify him. He's now rejected by the ones he came to save. Physically, carding. He then gets beaten, as the Old Testament would say, beyond human recognition. Beyond human recognition. Have you ever seen that before? I don't think you should Google it. He was beaten beyond human rec recognition. You couldn't tell that he was a human. Then he carried that cross as much as he could to Golgotha. He had a little bit of help from Simon. But he goes to Golgotha. Then they don't tie him to the cross. They nail him to the cross. And he hangs there when he should have been dead already. And you know there's a main, a main artery here. He should have bled in he was up there for hours and hours until every prophecy was fulfilled. You cannot kill the Son of God. It wasn't until every prophecy was fulfilled that he said, first of all, Father, forgive them. They don't know what he's doing. Then he said, it is finished. And it didn't say Jesus died. It said he gave up his spirit. What type of disciple, what type of followers do you think he was looking for? Miles, I'll see you once a week, Jesus. I'll see you ten minutes a day. He was looking for tenacious followers. He said, take up your cross and follow me. He's looking for people who are completely sold out. In joy, he sold everything he had. He's not looking for mild-mannered, weak need followers, Christians. He's looking for people who are sold out. He says, I do not take pleasure in those who shrink back. I don't take pleasure in the ones that are back and forth and back and forth and, and thrown by every wave of the sea. I'm looking for warriors who will fight on their knees, who will be persecuted because of me, who will go through trials of every kind because it's the East. It's the East. It's the East. He's looking for people that will get up. They beat Paul to a pulp. 
and left him outside the city for dead. Paul comes through, brushes himself off, and walks right back into that city. They need to perch on what I have. Because I am, I am part of the kingdom, and I house the king. He's looking for sold out, radical Christians. So acknowledge the king. That's your salvation call that gets you into the kingdom. Worship him. Live amongst unbelievers and affecting them. Let the king have every part of you and be all in. Because this kingdom has full provision, protection, relationship. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my king. I shall not.